Yes, it's all encompassing of skill and emotional control and not being destabilized and personal reflection. I mean, it, in addition to become a better trader, I, I think it helps you become a better person. I just basically watch film in my head when I hike. How did I do? Did I do something impulsive? Was I thinking correctly? My goal is to have 100% zero buyers or sellers remorse. I think most retail traders focus just on the magic entry, you know, the holy grail entry. I And even successful traders, I think we could always improve our plan. As one of my mentors, Dr. Alexander Elder taught me is you, you have no idea what the market's going to do, but if you don't know what, exactly what you're going to do, you know, you're dead. And unfortunately, usually you have to hit some kind of rock bottom or go through some huge, horrible drawdown until you internalize it and actually use it and do it. Welcome to the FMI podcast. The podcast which illuminates and explores the mental, emotional and psychological aspects of trading and investment performance. Welcome to today's episode of the Alpha Mind Podcast with myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall. Today, we're going to be interviewing veteran retail trader, Greg Gossett. Greg is into his third decade of retail trading and has been a great inspiration to many other traders who are trying to move into this extremely difficult and challenging area of retail trading. Greg has shown that it can be done, it can be achieved, and you can make good money from doing this. Greg also provides a daily mentoring service. He offers that free. He offers as a wrap up every single day you know, for over an hour on YouTube, going through the market and talking about various topics, including trader psychology, which is one of the reasons why we were attracted to have Greg on the podcast. This is an excellent interview and Greg shares a lot of powerful and deep insights and reflections on, uh, on the cornerstones to his trading approach and his method and some of the other aspects which are key to, you know, to helping to achieve success as a trader. Just a little bit more about Greg, you can uh, find him on Twitter at Gossip Trading and you can subscribe to him on YouTube, Gossip Trading and Mentoring. Before we go into the episode, just a quick thank you again to the many people who have contacted myself and Mark over the past couple of weeks. We got a lot of pleasure from doing this. Uh, we got a lot of enjoyment sharing our over 70 years of experience as market participants. As we always say to people, please, if you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Please rate it. You know, please also follow us on social media. At AlphaMind101 is our Twitter handle. And we also have our blog, the AlphaMindBlog.blogs spot.com before we commence with the podcast a couple of words from our sponsors this episode of the alpha mind podcast is co-sponsored by alpha our cube which delivers powerful coaching programs to financial market and investment businesses you can learn more about them on their website alpha r that's a letter r cube.com our other co-sponsor is the mark randall consultancy which delivers powerful personal professional and organizational performance optimization built around mind fitness programs Thank you, and now on with the podcast. So we're ready to start. We're going to go straight over to Greg, who's going to tell us a little bit about himself. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Mark. And first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. I, I think it's very helpful. I enjoy listening to it, and I share it with people. And, and uh, you know, thank, thank you for putting it together. I think it's great. Um, my name is Greg Gossett. I've been a full-time retail trader for the last 24 years. Um, I also do a daily podcast on YouTube where uh, each day I trade and I teach and I mentor during the last hour of the market. And um, I was exposed to the markets at quite a young age. Um, one day I was sitting in a room with my mother and the radio came on and there was the news about the market and they said, you know, the Dow Jones traded 23 million shares today, and I thought, that's strange. They have a real fascination with chairs. I thought they said shares, not shares. <laughs> and so I asked my mom, I said, why are they trading chairs? Why would they do that? And she explained to me, well, no, those are shares. Those are shares in stocks. And I said, oh, well, tell me about that. And, you know, I think I was 11, maybe 11 years old. And she kind of explained to me what the stock market was and, and that was it. That was the impetus of me being interested in the markets. And from then on, I actually had her get me a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
I read it every day. I don't really know what I learned from it, but I thought it would be good to start reading it. And then later on, when Investor's Business Daily came out, uh, started reading that, watching Wall Street Week uh, when I was like 13, 14 every Friday. <laughs> I was like, I think something's wrong with me. I, I don't know why I'm so interested in this. But as I got older, I got more interested. I kept studying and, you know, I went off to college and I thought, well, I'll probably be a stockbroker or financial advisor or something like that. But um, while it was a college, I thought up an idea of a new type of chewing gum. And I told it to my friends and they said, yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea. And so I started a company and I raised a little bit of money. And I was fortunate enough for this idea to really really take off. And it, I mean, it turned into a big company. We went public. Uh, we developed some big brand name, brand names, which are still brand names today. Um, and when I was about 25, uh, I sold out, I cashed out. And here I was 25 with a lot of money and no fear. And I had pretty much succeeded in most everything I had done in my life, which turned out to be a really bad combination for trading, I would find out later. <laughs> but that is uh, when I decided, okay, I'm going to be a trader. And that's when the adventure began. Wow. Wow, that's quite some story. But, so, <laughs> so, so you, 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 you became the chewing gum king. At a very early age, but was yeah. your passion always in trading? I'm, I'm sorry? Was your passion always for trading? Yes, of course. I mean, I, 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 I still always followed the market, but, uh, you know, until I sold my company, I, I never really had the capital to start trading. But, you know, of course, I was busy with the chewing gum business while I was in it, but yeah. I, I, just, I just knew that eventually, I was going to somehow get into the market, and you know, after I sold the company, that that was it. You know, that's like I said, that's that's when this crazy adventure of trading took over. And like I said, being being young and well capitalized, and no fear and no experience in trading was uh, just an absolute disaster initially. Okay, okay. So so if we could go back 24 years to when you started trading for a living, yeah. What, mm -hmm. what three things that you now know do you wish you had known then? So the first, by far the first, would be position sizing. And, you know, position sizing is so important. It directly affects how you're going to manage trades. It directly affects... Um, if you're going to stick to your plan, it directly affects your emotions, and your emotions ultimately affect everything about your trading. I mean, you know, uh, there's only two things that you have control of in the market, and that is when you buy something or sell something and how many shares or how many contracts that you're going to purchase. And then after that, really, we think we have control, but we don't have any control. And... You know, starting out, I took huge position sizes. It was horrible. I beat up my account. I mean, that, that's the number one piece of advice I wish somebody told me and that I would have listened to because that was initially the downfall <clears throat> of everything. And, you know, on my podcast, I mention this every day, and I'm sure my students get tired of it, but I beat them over the head with it every day. But, you know, trading is a skill. It's something you have to develop, just like any other skill. And in order to develop a skill, you have to have experience. And in regards to trading, the only way to have experience in trading is to trade for years, for many years. And the only way that you'll be able to do that is by staying in the game. And the only way you're going to stay in the game is to position size correctly and not to become destabilized emotionally. So I, I, think, I think that's the number one advice I would give any new trader is position size correctly. You know, any one position is just one of the next thousand trades. 
and to, you know, to take the long view of trading. Everybody talks about the long view of investing. I think people can relate to that, but when it comes to trading, I don't hear that a lot. I don't hear take the long view of trading. You know, where are you going to be five years, ten years from now? I think traders get um, <clears throat> fixated on, you know, the week or the month. And so I think, you know, taking the long view of trading, every trade is just an irrelevant one of the next thousand trades. Um, I, you know, and that, and then again, that ties back to position size, which allows you to do that. So I think position size is hugely important. Can I just ask a question around that? Um, sure. Really for the benefit of the audience, in terms of qualifying just how much risk you want to put on, uh, what kind of things are you sort of sort of interrogating in, in what you're looking at in terms of the market? What's what's guiding you? Is it sort of the is it is there sort of the potential risk of further volatility? Is it the extent of the potential profit of the trade? What what things are guiding that sizing? Well, you know, when I initially started out, uh, you know, I would use ATR, average true range, is a measure of volatility in regards to, you know, what my position size would be. Uh, but later in my trading career, I, I, I really wanted to keep it simple, Mark. And, uh, you know, I basically, I mean, it sounds ultra simple, but it does work for me, and it's pretty conservative. I, you know, I use a 10% position size. This is on equities, by the way. So, you know, if you have a $100,000 account, I never use more than 10% position. Uh, to purchase, you know, 10% uh, of my of my capital to visit, to purchase any one particular stock. So, uh, I, like I said, I know it's really basic. I used to use ATR as far as the volatility to measure the amount of position size, but I found that just a straight 10% for me works well. So, you know, you have $100,000. I'm never going to buy more than 10% of a position size of any one stock. Cool. That's great. Well, thanks. I think I think the audience will, uh, you know, keeping it simple is one of the things that applies in all sorts of areas of, the, of our business. And uh, keeping it simpler and uh, position sizing with that type of guidance, I'm sure that's useful for a lot of people out there. I hope so. Like it's it's really simple, but it it it's effective. Yeah, and and it, it's just just to sort of expand slightly on that because a lot of people listening are trading different markets and different products. So, right. you know, I guess when you say you're buying 10% of a stock, it's not the same as risking 10% because you're assuming. Oh, no. Yeah. So, for example, a futures trader is, might go, well, I'm, I'm, he's risking 10% of his account. Established. No. That would be different. <laughs> yes, yes. So we, I think, I think when I, I read a lot of these tweets and I see people arguing sometimes over these, these points. And then I realized that one guy's talking equities, where it's almost more of an investment in the actual full size, but he's only, you know, you must be thinking what well, the odds of that losing more than 10%, depending whether it's a liquid or a liquid product, are very low. So really, you're, you're maybe only risking 1% of your capital. Uh, you know, to be more specific, you know, when I set up a trade, I mean, I, I really don't risk more than a quarter of one percent on any right. one trade right okay okay so that's really interesting because you know it, it is one of those terms that i see different people trading different markets using and confusing other people yes and with futures it, you know that would be completely different i mean buying you know, 10% of your full capital in a futures position is completely different than 10% of your capital in, in a stock position, obviously, because of the leverage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, so that's your first point. Yeah, second point would be patience. Um, I think it's very important. I think patience is, uh, you know, not having to trade, I think, as retail traders. I think it's probably our number one advantage over the large, large traders, large financial institutions. Um, and I don't think individual retail traders take advantage of it. I, you know, I'm a big believer in identifying potential setups days before they may happen when you are completely objective, you're not impulsive, um, and waiting for the, the trade 
to come to you, not being impulsive and wanting to get into it earlier. I mean, over my career, I have found that waiting that extra day or two makes a big, big difference. So, um, you know, obviously impulsivity is a killer in trading and impulsivity ties into patience. But I, I think if you can develop patience, um, I think if you can sit on your hands, wait for the trade to come to you, and get in a habit of doing that, because of course once you develop a habit, it's much easier to um, stick with your plan. Um, uh, you know, we were yesterday was the first of October, and you know I was telling my students, look, you know, let's make a commitment this this month to every day do exactly what we're supposed to do as far as position sizing, as far as patience, waiting for everything, and you know, let's let's let those pathways in our brains connect and, you know, let's get in the habit of, of doing what we're supposed to be doing every day and, and not going outside of that. But yeah, pa patience would be my second one. I think, it's, I think it's hugely important and I think if people are honest with themselves and they look back at their, their trades, I, I think they'll find that a large majority of their trades came because they were impulsive and they didn't wait. Right. Okay. And how, how long did it take you to get to the level of patience that you consider um, that you're at now? 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. It's every day. It's, it's, you know, you never really have it figured out. I mean, you're, you're, you always have to defend against yourself. Um, some days you're stronger, some days you're weaker. Uh, but again, it, it goes back to habit. If you do it, if you do it every day for years, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's like smoking, you know. I mean, I, I quit smoking at the beginning of the year, and uh, I, it was such a habit, so hard to break. Um, so, yeah, you, you, just, you, just have to de you just have to develop, you just have to develop the habit. Right, right. And, and if you were to give yourself a mark out of 10 for patience currently, how would you grade yourself? Well, I'll tell you, I, I would have to give myself pretty good marks. Um, and, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this before the podcast began, but, you know, I, with the daily podcast that I do, you know, I have viewers every day and it's live. And, you know, my trades are out there for everybody to see. And I try to set a good example for my viewers. And... By doing that, by trying to set that good example, that has really helped with my patience as well. Because it's out there for it's out there for everyone to see. But it's something you have to work on all the time. You know, it's something. But I, yeah, I, I would give myself maybe a nine. I mean, you know, today, for example, of course, we're having a big day down in the market, and I looked, and you know, I got that little twinge of ah. This looks pretty low, but you know I'm an end of day trader, so I have to wait for the end of the day day, day trader. But even today, I felt that little, you know, that little urge, that little twinge of like, yeah, maybe I'll just grab in here a little bit earlier. But but you know, I had to catch myself and go, ah, what are you doing, right? So it's something you have to be aware of and monitor every day. Yeah, yeah, we're all here. It's it's a never ending journey. Never ending. That's I mean, it's never ending. You're 100 percent right. Yeah, I think okay. it's um, it's a combination of, of course, I mean, patience and discipline are so, I guess, connected in a way, aren't they? Um, they go hand in yeah. hand. That by being patient, you tend to develop discipline, and then that builds all sorts of benefits across the whole system. 100 percent. Yep. 100%. I'm going to cut in because a few weeks ago I asked some of our listeners if they have any questions for future podcasts. And we had a question. I, I wasn't planning to do this, but I've got the list in front of me. And there was a question okay. from Yuri or at DHCUH11 who asked, I'm trying to understand the best ways on the waiting to a trade. So I, I took that as meaning how to develop or cultivate patience. If if he called you now, what what would you say to him? 
I would say, you know, identify your setup or whatever your trigger is going to be. Uh, you know, look out in the future, see where that's going to be. Make some notes on your charts or on a piece of paper, post it up on the wall and say, okay, I'm going to buy Disney at X price if and when it gets there and it's my proper, and it's my, and it's a proper setup. Uh, if it does not going to get there, uh, I'm just going to let it go and I'm going to wait for uh, a setup to come that fits my criteria. I think, it, like I said, I think it's very important to identify potential zones where your entries are going to be days in advance so that you, you don't make that decision impulsively. And, um, and again, if you can go one day or two days or three days of sitting on your hands, uh, adhering to your plan that you set out when you looked at this trade, I, I think that if you can actually have the trade develop, take it when you're supposed to, or not take or not take it if it doesn't get there. I think if you can just go through one cycle of that, I think that will help you start to develop that I I adhere to my plan whether I entered or I didn't enter the plan, and then do it again on the next trade, do it again on the next trade. And then after a while, you're going to go, you're going to start feeling good about yourself that you adhere to your plan. And again, that gets back to repetition, that gets back to habit. And, you know, if I make a trading error or I do something I'm not supposed to do, it weighs heavily on me. You know, I, I walk my dog after the podcast each day and I review in my head, okay, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And I, I want to have 100% uh, sort of no buyer's remorse or no seller's remorse. I, I want to go on my hike and be completely clear-headed and feel not guilty that I did exactly what I was supposed to do. And if I and 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 if I do something I'm not supposed to do, it really I, I mean it really beats me up, and I don't like that feeling. So um, yeah, that's that's what I would suggest. Just make a plan, follow the plan. You're going to feel good about yourself when you follow the plan and keep doing it, and, and, and then, it, then it will become a habit. Or subscribe to Gossip Mentoring and Trading. You could do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that as well. Um, a quick word from our first sponsor, Avra Cube deliver powerful coaching programs which help traders and investment professionals move forward to achieve greater and more effective performance. Their programs have been delivered across all markets and focus on the person as a trader and how they can be more effective as takers and managers of risk. You can find out more about their work at alpharacube.com. You can view their AlphaMind Trader Performance Program on the page link at the top of the AlphaMind blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com, or email them info at alpharacube.com. That's the letter R. Now back to the podcast. So like I said, you know, with, with, yeah. with the podcast, I, 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 you know, I'm out there in front of everybody. I don't want to make mistakes. I want to set a good example, and it helps them. I was telling you before, ironically, you know, the podcast has made – I've never traded better because yeah. I'm teaching every day, you know. I'm explaining. When you teach something, you know it better yourself. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's another point which I just want to jump in, and I know Mark will probably have a view on this before we go on to number three. Um, you mentioned that after every day, after every podcast, you take your dog for a long walk and you think about yeah. what you did that day. Now, yeah. that really stands out for me because in my work as a coach, you know, I, I, I work with lots of traders. Um, you know, most of them are on the institutional side, investment banks, hedge funds, asset managers, but also private and retail traders. And I get asked, you know, you know, and also I was a trader myself for over 20 years. And I get asked, you know, what is it that makes a great trader? And there's a number of themes which I've identified on these areas. And one of them is deep reflection. And, and I, I asked yeah. a trader that I was coaching last year out in investment bank, and he's been there over 30 years, very successful trader. And I asked him, you know, what is it? What's your secret? What is it that you think gives you 
a huge edge that, that's you know that here 30 years later you're still hitting the ball out of the park you know every single week every single month and he said uh, he thought about it and he said if there's one thing he says he goes home every night and he reflects on what he did that day and he does yeah. deep reflection you know he doesn't yeah. just walk out the door and leave it at the door and i think that's something which is really undervalued and underappreciated but i've noticed that with so many of what i would call the great traders i've worked with over the years they do that they, they, they think about it you know this guy doesn't write it down but he makes mental notes um a lot of guys i know they, they journal it and they make notes of it you know it, it's a huge it's a huge part of success Steve, that, that, that's different, of course, from dwelling on failure, yeah? Yes, yes, completely different. You know, Just dwelling on your failure is failure. beating yourself up. Yeah. You know, this is more what I would call self-critique. Yeah. You know, what did I do well? What did I, you know, what could I have done better? You know, what should I observe? It, they, they do it in a really non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective, you start to touch on the things called fluid intelligence, which in busy moving professions, as it were, of which trading is one, the ability to step away, to reset, refresh, and recal recalibrate yourself is critical. And, have a, and I don't really care what method people choose, but having a method is the important part of the process. So the ability to step away, you know, hike, you know, cherish that moment with the dog. Um, it is a well-known formula that many, many people use. Um, I mean, I'm sure beyond just Greg, but people have a method. And so people need to recognize the need to have that ability to, to pause, you know, be it end of day, be it, be it predator, be it whatever, because it leads to a, a better mindset, a better mindset to observe where the next opportunity is going to come from, but also to, you know, constantly manage and check your trading setup, uh, to constantly manage and check your prioritization of whatever's next. And of course, that then leads through into the ability to, you know, trigger the right entry point or exit point of a trade. If you've got a mind stuff full of rubbish, then all that stuff goes to pot. So that. That, that, that's critical, that ability to not just switch off, but I mean, the reset, refresh, recalibrate, as you know, so those three R's, for me, I guess, critical. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just like if you were on a sports team, you watch film about your last game, you know, you watch film, what did I do right, what did I do wrong, and I just basically watch film in my head when I hike. How did I do? Did I do something impulsive? Was I thinking correctly? Um, you know, like I said, my goal is to have 100% zero buyers or sellers remorse at the end of the day. But, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I trade during at the end of the day, but the hike with the dog and the reflection and, you know, monitoring my emotions, you know, and, and being really honest and truthful and just kind of observing my mind and also what I did during the day. I mean, it, it, the, the hike is part of the trading process. You know, that is part of the process. Your, your dog is one of the tools. He's part of yes. your, he's part of your success. What's the dog's name? Katie. She sits with me each day to trade. That's why that's why on my YouTube channel there's a big picture of her. So we've got Greg and Katie. Uh, we Katie should have brought Greg. her along to join the join the podcast. <laughs> She's right here. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> something, Katie. <laughs> She's just looking at me. Okay, okay, bemused. <laughs> so anyway, so. That's a great second question. What about a third third thing? I think you have to have a, a plan or a process. And I, what I find uh, with what I do with teaching and, you know, when I interview new students is I find that they have a partial plan. You know, they may have an idea of a potential setup, um, but it's not a complete plan. I, I, I mean, you literally need a complete plan, sure. You know, your setup, your entry, but you know you also have to know exactly where you're getting out to the upside, where you're getting out to the downside. You know you have to play offense and defense on every single trade. Uh, you have to 
factor in, of course, position size, money management, correlation of positions. You know, it's it's all encompassing. And if you don't, you know, like I said, the, the, my students, they when they come to me, they generally have a partial plan. But in my opinion, you have to have a complete plan. You have to have an if-then statement for every single thing that you do. If this happens, I'm going to do that. If that happens, I'm going to do this. And like I said, money management, position size, correlations. Um, you you have to have a plan that encompasses everything, not just that I don't think partial plans will work. And then you have to get in the habit of, of having that plan, having that process, doing it every single day. And so, yeah, so th that's my third one is having a complete, complete plan. And if you don't have a plan, get with somebody, you know, a trader, a successful trader that you know, but put one together. It doesn't have to be the best in the world, but it has to be complete. Uh, and Greg, from those three qualities, do, do you find that with, with new students, actually, they're the qualities they absolutely need? Do, do I find that they're the qualities that they, that they need? That, yeah, they, that they need to particularly build upon and focus upon when you're, you know, you're, you're mentoring them into the markets? You know, the lack yes, of patience, I, I, lack of sizing, well, and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's generally a lack of a lot of things. Um, you know, I think most retail traders focus just on the magic entry, you know, the holy grail entry. I, 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 yes, they lack discipline, they lack a plan, they lack money management skills. You know, I'm not being, I'm not being derogatory, but, but in my experience, yes, they, mm -hmm. they have a very limited part of a plan and it's generally focused upon where they get in, not where they get out, not their money management, not their correlations. And even successful traders, I think we could always improve our plan. Yeah, yeah, and and you, I don't know if you'll be surprised to know, but you know we see the same thing happening with the big institutions as well, with new sure. traders and young traders. They're they're often thinking, what's the story? You know, what's the analysis saying? What's the you know, and and they they build a thesis on the market, but they don't have a plan to trade the thesis. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have a plan, what do you have? I mean, you don't you don't know what the market's going to do. But as one of my mentors, Dr. Alexander Elder, taught me, is you, you have no idea what the market's going to do. But if you don't know what, exactly what you're going to do, you know, you're dead. You're dead as a trader. You know, it's uh, it's, it's such a good point. But it's I think the challenge is, you know, I, I meet a lot of people who know this, but they haven't yet internalized it. Right. And that's where the yeah. challenge is. And unfortunately, usually you have to hit some kind of rock bottom or go through some huge, horrible drawdown until you internalize it and actually use it and do it. I mean, you know, the, there's a lot of trading cliches out there, but the reason they're around is because they're true. But unfortunately, until you have gone through a huge loss or hit rock bottom, you you know, I think there's that, eventually there's that aha moment with traders who've really gotten beaten up in the market where they go, oh, you know, I've been hearing this for years, but I just kind of went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they go, it's true. And that's why people say it. Yeah. So yeah. the advice is, you know, learn from people who have gone through it. Don't, don't hit rock bottom and then finally, have the heavens op open up to you and go, oh, these these pieces of advice were good. I mean, learn from others so that you don't have to go through it. But, you know, sometimes that's hard. Yeah, yeah. Listen, there's one point. I mean, those those three points were brilliant. And just just to recap, recap them, you know, your first one was position sizing. Number two was patience. And then number three was developing a plan, a, a process and a plan. Uh, which could also mean a system or a method, I guess, depending how you, how you term it, um, sure. that, that covers, you know, not just the analysis or the entry, but all these other aspects, money management, risk management, risk management correlation, um, which which I think confuses a lot of people. But they, you know, a lot of people get into trouble with that. They just get too many positions on, and then it just sort of. It, 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 they all fall out of bed together. 
But, um, Greg, did, was the hiking always part of the afterday, or was that something that's more recently evolved? <laughs> even even from a kid. My mom is from Switzerland, and she, as a kid, she always took me up into the, the mountains a few times a week, and it, it just became a habit. But, you know, yeah. we're talking about life. that third Right. So that third point that with with the plan or the process again that that hike is part of the process yeah. the emotional yeah. process of the trading but yeah I thoroughly enjoy hiking I I I do it every day for a couple hours up in the mountains and I live up in the mountains and so I just out my door and up the trails. I'm going to interrupt the podcast because at this point in the podcast the conversation took a slightly surreal turn. Mark asked a question about performance and the impact of chewing gum. Now, I need to just explain some context here. Before Greg became a trader, after he left university, he was an entrepreneur in the chewing gum business, creating and inventing some chewing gums, making his first money from selling those chewing gum businesses to other manufacturers. Hopefully this context is useful for you to kind of understand some of the conversation which came next. Before we do, a quick word from our other co-sponsor. The Mark Randall Consultancy delivers powerful personal, professional and organizational performance optimization. Mark Randall is regarded as one of the world's leading providers of applied corporate mindfulness. Mark's core service is the HIIT Mind Fitness Program. This is a form of applied military grade mindfulness based on the same programs used by US military special forces to help deliver optimal performance when engaged in operations. You can contact Mark on email CEO at Mark Randall Consultancy.com. Now back to the podcast. I've got another <laughs> question for you. This is this is like a really odd question. We're, we're, and I played a lot of golf and I, I did a bit of mentoring around golf as well. Um, and there's stuff going on in golf, and because of your chewing gum link, I want to ask you a question about performance and uh, uh, re reduced cognitive errors that has now been said to be something that you'll see a lot of top-end golfers actually now start to chew a lot of gum. And they're chewing a lot of gum because there's a feeling that it's really enhancing productivity, reducing sort of mental errors and, and errors and increasing sharpness. Have you noticed anything? Is that something that you do? With you're saying that chewing gum d does this, exactly. or chewing a specific type of gum? No, 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 not not yeah, not, not juicy fruit or anything like that or whatever. But there appears to be a link coming out of the sports world of um, a uh, sort of National Institute of Health type research saying that actually, from a performance point of view and a sharpness point of view and a cognitive sort of um, you know reduced error and better decisions, actually, if you chew gum. You perform better. You perform huh. better. You're not, that's not come your way well, yet. Well, in a way, it really did come my way because while I was in college, I was a professional triathlete, and the, the, the way that I came up with the idea of my first gum product was that there was an ingredient, guarana from South America, and kind of an in, in, in uh, performance enhancer, and uh, when I was out racing or training, you know, I'd have to swallow this pill, which I didn't like, and I thought, gosh, you know, I really like gum. Maybe I'll just put this in a gum, and so essentially, you know, I developed the first caffeine gum for that exact reason, for the performance of the gum and the caffeine. I thought it was just the caffeine, but who knows, maybe it just was the act of chewing as well. I, I know a lot of poker players, I, I do know a lot of athletes that chew a lot of nicotine gum for that exact reason as well. Yeah, that's something that I'm, I'm watching carefully because there's, a, there's an increasing amount of research coming out about it, and uh, not that we're getting everyone to chew gum, of course, but I mean, well, I've, I've, how I've it's, got to interrupt I'm, you there, not the obvious stuff that's affecting performance. I'm going to interrupt you there because I've actually decided to Google it whilst you were talking about that. And there is a research piece here by Biomed Research International. Chewing gum, cognitive performance, mood, well-being and associated physiology. Recent ev evidence has indicated that chewing, chewing gum can enhance intention as well as promote well-being and work performance. Yeah, it so, is. Crazy, right? But it's it's out there. Interesting. Uh, if if yeah. Wrigley's are, if Wrigley's are interested in sponsoring this podcast, oh, there we got a man that knows how to make gum. <laughs> <is. laughs> 
I could probably, I could probably get you. I could probably get you a meeting on that if you wanted to pitch them. Trade gum. There you go. There you go. There's, there's your next your next sideline, Greg. Greg. Uh, never mind, Greg. That's the three of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. I had no idea. It's like a bit of fun, but actually, there's there's a, there was a point in me saying that because it's noticeable in golf that there's an awful lot of guys now that weren't chewing gum that are chewing gum. And they appear to be getting up the leaderboard more than they got, they did before. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. It I does a lot of that. I never really noticed. Mm. It does a lot here where they said it, it can reduce feelings of stress, that's anxiety, right, yeah. and depression. Yeah, it sounds like it's better than mindfulness. Well, you, you're out of a job. Well, I'll be changing to selling <laughs> chewing gum from now. Uh, yeah, cool. No, thank, it's, it's good, good of you to make that analogy with uh, you know the the triathlete and the performer and the poker player and of course yeah. the trader um who knows who knows what is giving you that slight bit of edge that suddenly makes a difference on the big trade i don't know if you ever read the the hour between dog and wolf john Coe. i have so, so i have i haven't personally you you have one hell of a book. it's a great book it was it was uh, I, I should put that actually on my my book list, The Hour Between Dog and Wolf by John Coe. And um, it, it, it's, it talks about, he, he was a Wall Street tur trader who turned, uh, turned Cambridge neuroscientist. And he, he re the book is all about the biology of financial boom and bust and showing how risk taking transforms our body chemistry. But in it, he talked about how certain traders who were very competitive, um, they, they had a finger imbalance. Do you remember that bit? The second finger and the and the fourth finger on the hand. Yeah. Or actually, I think they were in line, and they had different testosterone levels, and they were more competitive, and they they no. they were more successful as traders. That makes sense. I've heard of, I've heard of that study in a different context, but yeah, the length of your first finger and your index or your index finger and your middle finger, the ratio there has to yeah. do with how much testo testosterone you have. But then again, of course, testosterone could be. You know, that could be a negative as well in trading. Well, I, 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 yeah, I think that's interesting. And, um, you know, I think it depends. You know, obviously there's other factors involved. But I, I think it made people, you know, a, a, again, like yourself, you're, 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 a, you're a triathlete, okay? You're a performer I, in other fields. And this is where I get back to trading a lot of the time. Trading is a performance activity. It's not an academic activity. And I think this is one of the mistakes a lot of people have when they come into trading. They think if you're intelligent and you're intellectual, you're going to succeed at it. But I think it's more about emotional intelligence. The sort of skills that you see in great performers in all fields from sport through to um, music, dance. It is a performance activity. And as you said before, it's a skill that takes many years to learn. Yes, it's all encompassing. <laughs> Yeah, trading is yeah. all encompassing of skill and emotional control and not being destabilized and and personal reflection. I mean, it's you know, I think the one thing is is if you know you start to master these things. I, in addition to become a better trader, I I think it helps you become a better person. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I definitely yes. agree with that. Definitely agree with that. Absolutely. Or a worse person. Sometimes I didn't like myself. When I was a trader, sure, I didn't like the person I became. But I, I, I think you become very cynical. One of the things I've noticed over the years, I, I, and in fact, I, I, I do, I, I, um, I, I do a psychometric when I coach traders. I take them through a particular psychometric about people's uh, risk personalities. And when I attended the course from the company um, that I had to be accredited to use this tool. The company said that they tested it on thousands of people from all different professions, but it was the stock, the stockbrokers and the traders that shocked them because they were so cynical to a completely different level than any other profession. Ah, I can see that. I can see that for sure. It, 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 it is amazing. And I've, I, I think, you know, you, you, you become very distrustful of information, other people, yeah. you know, yeah. news, you know, you, you'll see something on, as we've all had several times in our experience, we've read a financial newspaper, 
or seen C and B and C, and you think I'm going to do what they do, and of course that's always a disaster. Yeah, you also <laughs> yeah. stop trusting yourself. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know that sort of I'm not good enough, and you become a cynic of your own method, and that's when your plan definitely disintegrates. I think that's a function back to position size <laughs> again, because yeah. of course if you have if you have a drawdown. Um, I mean, when do you feel bad about yourself? When do you when are you mad at yourself? It's of course after you've had losses, and especially if there's large losses. And again, you know, back back to position size. If you position size correctly, if you take the long term approach of trading, so any you know, you, one this trade is just the next one of the next thousand trades, then it doesn't have that emotional energy. Um, so that that's why I, I, you know position sizing to me is so so important because it. The, the, I, I, in my opinion, the main goal in trading for a trader is to not become destabilized. If you mm. become destabilized, you, you're not going to follow your plan. If, you, if you're going to be impulsive, you're going to make some really bad decisions. I think if we look back at our trading careers, some of the biggest losses have come because we were revenge trading or we were frustrated. And that initially probably became because our position size initially was too large and it destabilized us. So, I mean, just a kind of big overview, try to not become destabilized. And in my experience, a conservative position size is, is the best way to do that. Yeah, it's kind of like a preventative strategy, right? 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and we're, we're getting close to probably where we've got to start thinking about wrapping, wrapping up this podcast. Um, you, you were just talking about those those drawdowns, those big drawdowns, where you know you 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 you, fa you have a failure of process or something, you know, everyone has them, and and I guess people would like to know that you're human in some way, Greg. <laughs> what, what were your what were your biggest ones? Well, like I said, when I started trading, I was young, I was scared of nothing. Um, I didn't have any experience, and you know, I started in the mid '90s, and of course, at that point, not large position sizes and not being scared of anything worked well, and I thought trading was the easiest game in the world. However, after 2000 came, of course, my position sizes were high. I always felt like the market was come back, and I took a massive, massive drawdown. I mean, almost to the point where I couldn't function. And so what I did was I took three months off. I walked the entire coast of Oregon with one of my German shepherds, and I did three months of reflection of what did I do right, what did I do wrong. Um, and at the end of the trip, I realized I just don't know what I'm doing. And so I, I said, okay, I'm either going to quit trading and just swallow this loss and be done with it and move on, or I'm going to learn how to trade for real. And what I did was I reached out to several well-known authors and traders and begged and pleaded and bribed them to teach me. And I, for years, I studied one-on-one -on -one with these gentlemen, uh, different type of trading approaches. Um, and I put the work in, you know, I put the work in, I really concentrated on risk reward, keeping my losses small, having the strength to hold on to winning trades um and you know that's that's what turned things around for me was putting in the work you know and uh, and, and coming up with a real all-encompassing plan based upon good trading principles but that was a very very difficult time and i'm glad i did that walk i'm glad that i took you know a self-inventory of what i what i did wrong and came to the realization i just didn't know what i was doing and and i'm glad i kept at it you know, because, you know, now I'm a successful trader and I really enjoy it. And and more than that, you know, I really enjoy teaching what I've learned to people. You know, I mean, the, the podcast is free. You know, I, I'm there. I'm there to help people and new traders and, and hopefully teach them. And hopefully they'll learn what I've, you know, the mistakes I've learned over the past. And, and you know, hopefully, hopefully it will help them in, in their trading. Terrific. And, and one final question I've got for you along this this point and and I know it's hard to say probably probably is very hard to say there's a definitive 
time or place where you started to become consistent. But, you know, roughly in terms of years, do you know where that was? After I really started putting together a real plan and, 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 and orchestrating it each day and following each day, I would probably say five years. Five years, that's great. Yeah, because that, that's interesting because I, I tell people often that, you know, it, it takes four to five years doing it from scratch, in my opinion, to start becoming, to get to that point. And you, you, you really put some hard effort and work in. And, and, and I think that's with good mentoring as well. You, you clearly had some good teachers and good mentors. Um, I, I, I know a few that have probably done it in a bit less, but I would say they were in trading rooms surrounded by people mentoring them. And, and I know many who have taken much longer, and I would say myself included, uh, to get to that point. Um, and it almost goes back to that, that first point you said about patience. You know, take the long view of trading. I, I always tell people, don't worry about earning, worry about learning. If you get that right, the earning will come much later on. But if you focus on earning in the early, even year or two, it's just going to screw with you. Yes. You know, I agree 100%. And I, and I might add that I think it took me a little bit longer because I had, I had all these bad habits in my gunslinging first years of trading. And, um, you know, it's kind of a golf analogy. But if you've been a golfer for 20 years and, you know, you've just been playing and you have bad form and then one day you go to a golf professional, it's going to take a while for him to break you of your bad habits because you have them so ingrained in your mind. I think one of the advantages of a brand new, fresh trader that doesn't have any bad habits is starting off with a coach or, you know, a mentor and I think they have a huge advantage because they don't have to unlearn a lot of bad behaviors that they've had. So I, I think that's a huge advantage for a beginner if they start off with someone that teaches them correct principles from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. And I think people, people under, undervalue that. I think they think there's a lot of people I know who think they could do it themselves. You know, they'll pick up a book, they'll go on an online course, they, they, they'll do some technical analysis. Uh, and they think they're they're ready to go and stop, which is, you know, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, it the, could not be further from the truth. Yeah. I mean, I I, I don't do mentoring. I, I always say to people, I work with people probably at a later stage, but the right. value of a mentor just can't be. I, I I don't think you could put you could put money on it. Or I think it would help a lot of people, whether it's trading or any other sport having some kind of mentor and learning from somebody with experience I, I, I think is helpful. I mean being out there by yourself in trading, if you're not around other traders or people to give you advice, they, you know, it's a lonely road. It's a lonely road. I think it can drive you crazy. But again, you gotta have some kind of plan and if I can leave off, please, please, please position size conservatively. No matter how bad of a trader you are, at least you won't get that hurt until you get some experience and start improving your, your, your trading process. Okay, brilliant, lovely. Well, listen, thank you, Craig. I, I'm gonna hand it over to, and anything you wanna add before we finish, or can I hand it over to Mark? Uh, uh, I would just like to say hello to everybody on my podcast, all my regulars that come every day. I, I just like to give them a shout out and say hi and hope they're all doing well. And give give yourself a plug again. What's your what's the link to the to the uh, podcast? Um, it's called Gossip Trading and Mentoring Live, and it's on YouTube. And uh, like I said, I I trade live each day, and I also teach and I mentor. Uh, and it's during the final hour of the U.S. stock market. Thank you, Mark. Do you want do you want to just take us out there? Well, Greg, I think. We've had so much insight in this hour from your journey. It's been been truly tremendous for us to just have this conversation. I'm glad we talked about Katie. <laughs> I'm glad we talked Me about the hike. I'm glad we talked about a bit of chewing gum and, well, is it worth looking at that? But importantly, those three qualities, the, um, the ability to size, being patient and having a plan, uh, 
And if you haven't got a mentor, go and get one because building that base is just critical. So, Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to both of you, and thanks for putting out such a great podcast. And I've learned a lot from, uh, you know, your your other guests, and uh, I appreciate the work and the energy and that you know that you're putting into this. So thank you to Greg Gossett once again for being an outstanding guest on this week's Alpha Mind podcast. Next week we have James Brody, and that's going to be another terrific interview. And I promise you, you will learn truckloads of insight, information, knowledge from listening to our chat with James. If you've enjoyed this podcast or any of our previous podcasts, please, we ask you once again, please rate us. That helps the Alpha Mind podcast climb up the rankings, which means that more people get to know about, about us and to hear our interviews. You know, likewise, also share our knowledge of our podcast with your colleagues, with your peers, with any groups that you're on. I'm sure it will be great value to them as well. You know, I, I wish I had something like this to listen to when I when I started out in trading. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a pleasure. We, we enjoy doing this. Uh, we've got many great guests lined up over the next few weeks. You can also go back to listen to some of our previous interviews we're starting to build a great library of uh, of past episodes now so yeah it's been really great and um thank you once again to my co-host mark randall uh, as a reminder we are active on social media my twitter handle is at alpha mind 101 and i post regularly on twitter mark is a little less active but he could be found on twitter at the mind guys we also have a blog page alpha mind blog .blogspot.com. We have lots of interesting articles on there and links to pages with resources for traders, including details of books on trader mindset. We've got a, a page link to books and courses on technical analysis. And also we have details of the Alpha Mind Trader Performance Coaching Program that we offer. Uh, there's also a list of other excellent podcasts for traders, as well as the Alpha Mind blog. We have a group on LinkedIn called the Alpha Mind Group. You can also find out more about us on our website. Uh, where you can see our contact details, and that is alpha-mind.net. And really, that just leaves me to say, once again, thank you for listening, and have a great week. Thank you. Trading for me is like a daily exorcism of all my demons. Oh,